kind of trickles down and puts an, a kind of pressure on people making Tri films. It trickles down yeah. to Pootie Tag. Like it, yeah, to Pootie, the destruction. <laughs> Is that a tough sell? Uh, say Chris no, it boy. wasn't, and actually I probably wish it was more of a tough sell. But uh, yeah, it was supposed to be just a weird, quirky movie uh, made for a small amount of money. But then they people got excited that it might be a franchisable character, so they put a lot more expectation. Yeah, I think that's, uh, right. that's a dangerous thing. <clears throat> this yeah, is, this is a franchise so before it's even, yeah. yeah. Well, because of the TV experience. I mean, when we were shooting the, shooting the movie, was a great time. We were, but then they started coming and visiting and saying how great they thought it was, and that was really scary. So later down the line, when we were editing, they had a lot of, you mm -hmm. know, high number expectations of it that it never could have uh, achieved. But the, the process of trying to get it there was very painful the film and me but <laughs> but uh, overall it was a good thing to happen because uh -huh. none of the pain you experience and stuff like that sticks with you really if you're smart about it it just goes away and all that's left is that I got to make a movie right. and even the worst parts of it were just fascinating mm -hmm. to be on the inside of a movie and go, uh, under siege uh -huh. it, it was fascinating because yeah. I never thought I'd get that opportunity sure you know I was in this big office and the I used to drive by the Paramount lot thinking, I wonder if I could ever get in that gate. And uh, here I'm in John Goldwyn's office, you know, right, Samuel right, right. Goldwyn's grandson, going, this movie is horrible and unreleasable, <laughs> screaming at me. And, and I should have been thinking, oh, this is the death of my career. But I was just thinking, wow, gee whiz, <laughs> this More. is Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this guy is, you know, powerful and he hates me. And, you know, wow. Yeah, and they, got, they, they got literally got up mad like visibly yeah he shaking. got really angry he he was, his, his voice was shaking he's a pretty seems like a pretty cool character every time i've been in there i guess i've never i guess well you never made a movie he hated that deeply but the thing was that well, i was did you like it did you i wouldn't like what eventually came out i liked oh, okay. what i showed him what you showed him right uh, and then they and one thing it. you know that i never was felt too bad about it because he was very uh passionate about the hate and he <laughs> ran down like details it's like, oh, and then why would a man who uh, shuns every woman uh, and uh, makes a beautiful woman drink milk from a saucer on the floor uh, <laughs> fall for such an ugly, disgusting pig of a floozy? And uh, he was really angry that Hootie like, fell point. for the woman that he did. And I thought, wow, you really paid attention. You really got into that. <laughs> you know, he wasn't going like, what, what do we waste our money on? He didn't like make calls during the movie. He watched and he said, no, that's wrong. And so I was very proud of that. And uh, Pootie Tang would never do that. No, yeah. yeah. I mean, it hurt. It was, it was you painful. Knew better than you knew Pootie. <laughs> to go through that and they get kicked out of the editing room and just you, you, you feel shudders in your body. Of, wow, these guys don't mess around. But it's, it's kind of like... is real. Yeah, but it would be like if Mike Tyson like kicked your ass. <laughs> Part of you would be going, oh, cool, it's Mike Tyson. This is what it's like to get my ass kicked by Mike Tyson. Yeah. And I didn't realize this about you, but mm. you are the man responsible for the film... Pootie Tang. Yes, yeah. That oh. Chris Rock did. That's right. And you had a horrible experience with that. I wrote. <laughs> you I wrote, wrote it. <laughs> I wrote and directed Pootie Tang. But then, yeah. didn't the studio lose faith in you during it? They, yes, they sure did. Yeah, and they took you off the film. Yeah, they took me off. The film. Well, I had already shot it, and it was during the editing process. They hated my cut. They let me do. They fired my editor, got another guy, and let me do one more cut. Chris Rock was the star. He was the, well, one of the stars. Yeah. He read the script. He liked mm -hmm. it. The, I assume the studio read the script and liked yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that a character that was sort of on the Chris Rock show? Yeah, Pootie yeah. Tang Pootie was the character we did on the Chris Rock show. Right. And you worked on that show, and you yeah, said, "Hey, I created I the character there." Yeah. I'm going to make a movie about Pootie Tang. Well, he, Chris asked me, "Do you think there's a movie in that guy?" And I said, "That's uh, that's you a little nutty, but I'll me. try it." I would have told you no. <laughs> <laughs> well, and of course you're going to say. Yes. So, yeah, I wanted right. to make movies, yeah, very badly. And so the network, that show was very popular. The network, yeah. I mean, the, the studio was probably excited about sure. it. Sure. You go out, you shoot the thing, you write mm -hmm. the thing, you do mm -hmm. all of it. And at what point does the, the studio say to you, listen, you, you fuck? <laughs> what have you done here? I remember that point. Right. It was a great moment in my life. Who comes to see you? It, I went, had to be, I got brought, they, they summon you. I got flown yeah. out to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking, wow, I'm getting flown to L.A.? First class. Uh -oh. They don't even tell First you. class. I have no idea. <laughs> well, I kind of smelled something, but yeah. they took me to Paramount, you know, those gates. It's like you feel like that you're going to the White House, and uh, I went to John Goldwyn's office. He was Samuel Goldwyn's grandson. He's uh -huh. a big guy. I know that. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm in his office. I'm in the most important office at Paramount. He was running the studio at the time, and he's he just, he... 
I remember I walked in and he's shaking a little. He was so <laughs> mad. <laughs> and he just unloaded. Everybody was there that was involved in the movie. He oh. just unloaded on me and said, this movie is unreleasable. <laughs> you have wasted my money. This is irresponsible. I have a problem with everyone here. And then this guy who was the president of MTV Films, who yes. was, they said, well, John, I don't think you really got the film. How dare you say that to me? Oh, screaming God. at company presidents because of my movie. Oh, wow. There was nothing redeemable about the movie. Now, Not to him, but here's the thing. How do you me, go on in show business after well, that, like that? I'll never forget that moment because I feel my whole... All I wanted to do was make movies at the time and that was being destroyed <laughs> by Samuel Goldwyn's grandson. He knows something. Yeah, yeah a little yeah, bit. Right. And I'm sitting there, but a part of me was outside of my body going, you are in the, uh, the Paramount big office being yelled at by... Sam how fucking cool is this? <laughs> really? How you were able to? Yes, see, I was able to enjoy it. You turned it, it into a wow. positive. Absolutely, because who gets to have that very rare, beautiful experience to get to have that? You know, I read How to Make Friends and Influence People, but for you to have such a positive attitude as your, as your career is... Well, to me, uh, to me, the, the key is, like, surviving failure is a great... It just turns you... It's, it's a very great uh, experience. Tell have, me about you it. Know? Cause you, <laughs> yeah, look, I went through all of that, Howard, and, and they killed, you know, the press... I, mean, I grew up watching Siskel and Ebert on PBS, you know, right, when it right. was that show, and... And so I always dreamed when I was a kid, someday Roger Ebert and that other dude is dead are going to look at me through the camera and say something about my movie. <laughs> and here was Roger Ebert saying, Pootie Tang is so bad, it, I don't even understand what it is. This isn't even a movie. It's not even complete. But, like, he was, <laughs> and, um, he's a, yeah, right. He's like, well, why don't they shoot the director? <laughs> yeah, he was like so <laughs> hateful. And I'm having the experience of becoming famous for making a movie everyone unanimously thinks is awful, including Robin, who I grew up listening to and loved. Right. Why, did the, why did the studio, do you think, release Pootie Tang? Why didn't they just put it on the shelf? Um because Chris was in it and he was hot. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it made its money back and it's been... I get good checks for Pootie Tang. It's really? really well, yeah, That's the cult amazing. hit. People dig it. Wow. I can't look at two minutes of it. <laughs> <laughs> it just turned into a train wreck. But it, I think it might have been a good movie if we had done it all one way. It's just that they wanted to backtrack and try to do something else with it. And, you, know, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Speaking it happens. Of, yes. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, Artie. Figure. Artie, speaking the maker of what? Of Beer League, the yes. maker of Beer League has something he wants to say. <laughs> speaking of films, I just to give Louie a plug. He made a movie called Tomorrow Night, which is one of the funniest fucking things I've ever seen. Yeah. Oh, that okay. our friend Robert Smigel is actually in, too. That's he's in it. Yeah. It's a few Steve years Carell's back. in that, too. Is that available anywhere, Louie? It's under my bed somewhere. <laughs> I, never, I mean, because that... Sundance and it never got released. But Man, what, the thing fun. is that Louis... going, going through that, though, How, uh, Howard, and, get, and getting through it, and right. then a few months later realizing I survived that that was really hard but mm. i feel fine it doesn't stick to you but, You're, but, you but i'm so much smarter and but, i think that the my show now yeah. it totally is succeeding because pootie tang failed i swear to god it wouldn't have happened without right. the other. i agree with you i think you have to go through a certain amount of tragedy but i mean you've had your share but i wanted to ask i mean like as a result of that does chris raw i mean do people like move away from you for a while a lot of people did chris, chris, chris never did chris he never did I, chris and i are very good friends oh, good. Okay. and we wrote a movie together since then we've done a lot of things chris has never said you motherfucker <laughs> no we got, i think we had one phone call where we were like you know like Clinton and Gore after that, after the election. Whose fault is this? <laughs> it's not my fault! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but no, it's yeah, you, but there are people that moved away from me, and they're all reading about me in the trades, right. having my own show yeah. now. That's so right. I don't, after a while, the lesson yeah. here is your attitude. I mean, how you, uh, <laughs> yeah, what you yeah. glean from that mm -hmm. horrible meeting with yeah. Samuel Goldwyn's uh, grandson mm -hmm. ranting and raving at you, yeah. and you took it the way you did. You mm -hmm. have that resilience. I think that's what uh, makes it possible. I think that comes well, from going to, to retarded camp. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the eight dollar blowjob to myself. <laughs> Osama bin Laden. He's actually very shy. <laughs> well, you learn what beatings life can give you and then you go, well, I'm not afraid. And I thought when I did this show, I might get the shit kicked out of me again, but I've had the shit kicked out of me. <laughs> Louis, and Louis, Louis here, parents. So fuck it, I'll give it a shot. Louis. Um, and then a fella named uh, Joshua Mabe wrote me and uh, he wrote me kind of a long email that I didn't r read all of, but he asked me about Pootie Tang and about the visual elements of the movie, and, and uh, he, he seemed to think that I approached it as a filmmaker, which I did. And uh, he remember, he noticed that I, I hired Willie Courant as the director of photography for Pootie Tang, and Willie Courant was an eminent uh, kind of new wave French, very old... Uh, director of photography who um, made films with Serge Gansborg and uh, he made a film with uh, 
Godard, um, masculine, feminine, and uh, worked with a lot of other great filmmakers. And uh, he was an amazing guy to work with. Um, and yeah, no, I took Puri Tang very seriously as a film. I wanted to be a film director and direct a real movie about a guy who talks in a undiscernible language. Um, Chris Rock gives great advice. I know him, know him nearly as well as you do. I, I know him. No, he's actually. very smart. He's, he's got a good instincts. He's brilliant with the business. Yep. Like business. Everything he's ever said to me, as far as the business is concerned, mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. on the money. No, when I was doing, when I was making Pootie Tang, when we were in pre-production, I was uh, there's this producer on the movie Cotty Chubb, and uh, he was like my right hand man. He was doing everything for me. And Chris came up to me and said, that guy's going to take the movie away from you, eventually. Oh. And I was like, that's crazy. He's my partner. This guy's got my back. And he goes, no, he, that guy is going to eventually take this movie away from you and kill you. And it's exactly what, what happened. happened. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, he just you. knew it. He didn't even know the guy. He saw the two of us talking, and he's like, yeah, that's the guy. That's the guy they picked to watch you and help you, and then in the end, he's going to screw you. Oh. <laughs> and that guy did pry the movie away from me and fuck me hard in the ass. He uh, he learned that through having that done to him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he knows yeah. he's uh, he's good enough Very now perceptive. at the game to go, he just goes, oh, that's that guy who does that. And now I'm that way. Now I can do that. You just you know you can tell the future. certain people and who they are because there isn't really that much variety in any there one isn't. industry. Like, I've noticed that too. Like <laughs> If you go from industry to industry, no matter what it is, yeah. there's that guy and there's this a guy. guy. With, there's the guy with the nervous laugh who will sell you out eventually yep. under yep. pressure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, you know, there's the dude. There's like all kinds of people. There's the chick. There's the woman who, like, takes during a meeting. She takes off her shoes and then sits kind of cat-like and says how much she loves you. Mm -hmm. And she'll eventually fuck you up the ass right. with somebody else's dick. <laughs> she'll rip off some other guy's dick <laughs> and just sh put it on right the end of your a ass. broom and shove it up your ass. <laughs> But yeah. you learn the players because they're not the thing they're not good at is changing shape or or, or no, tactics. They're not shape changers. No, no they're not. They're just Very they're obvious. vicious and but they're not. They're you know you can walk around them once you learn the the greatest. Terrain. The yeah. greatest. I wish it's I could. I wish guys. I could find the tape from when I did a uh, Pootie Tang. There's a part in the uh, in the movie where. Uh, he makes a, a hit record, but it's silence. Mm -hmm. There's no sound to it. So there's a montage of all these people uh, reacting to it. And when and it was in the script, it just said an uh, Asian, a young Asian boy is listening to the nothing, and his father runs in the d room and says, "Turn that noise down," you know, like any father would. Yeah. And I just wrote Asian just because in my that's what I saw. I didn't want, but every auditioner, every single one. Uh, the audition goes the same as, Who are you turn that down? You're driving me crazy. Oh, and then really? you hear me or the person auditioning going, it's not supposed to be a stereotype Asian. And then yeah. the actor goes, oh, I'm sorry. And then he just does it. <laughs> oh, as as the sorry. good American that he is. Because <laughs> right. none of them were... Well, they were all American-born oh Asians, yeah. but they just assumed, oh, they want me to go, oh! He wants the wacky, I like, no, I yeah. actually don't want the 1944 yes. version. Oh, go the hole! Blame right. him. I thought of doing I that thought... when I was doing Pootie Tang, and they were they fired me off the movie. <laughs> I thought seriously about taking you? a beta tape to Canal Street. It was white. I'm just dropping it. Why did you get fired from... <laughs> you were directing it, right? Yeah, I wrote it and directed it. And they fired you during the movie? No, I was during the editing. Oh. I got to shoot the whole movie, but wow, during we were, editing. Yeah, well, that's when what all the fighting happens. <laughs> the editing is when things get bad. Yeah, yeah. That's when nobody likes the movie and they fight over how to how to fix it. You have your idea or, of what you want. Did you just and, shoot eggs out of your nose? Yeah, it's all over. <laughs> <my hand. laughs> Who fired you? Um, the studio. I didn't officially get fired. I just they 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 do it in a really fucked up way. They flew me out to L.A. because they moved the editing to L.A. And they flew me out there. And then I show up to give notes. Like I'm, and they go, get, what are you doing here? Like I go to the studio where they're editing. And they go, what are you doing here? I'm, I'm here to give, you know, to edit. And they're like, no, go to your hotel. They put me up in a really nice hotel and flew me out first class. They said, just go to your hotel and we'll send you the reels as we cut them. Ugh. And I'm like, well, then I give you notes over the phone. No, because we have to lock the reels now. So we'll just. So I'm like, you just mean I'm going to be the first one to watch the movie. You're pieces. out of yeah the whole loop yeah. as far and then, as. And, then, and I was like, you can't. And he goes, fuck you. We flew you out here. We gave you a first class ticket. 
<laughs> like it was really it was a really weird, creepy way to go about were it. Were they editing stuff and you were just like, Why the fuck did you Oh I hate it. Cut it I like that it. and I hate yeah. It. Mm. I mean it's a bad movie. It's <laughs> it's a bad it movie. Is. I mean I made a bad movie. I, I, I honestly don't know. The it's, thing is, like crazy. having somebody edit your shit like that after you film it and, and have a vision of what you wanted and then just have pieces cut out of it well and also like, they no, added I thought that was dumb kind of narration good. like the movie was meant to be kind of awkward and strange that's the way that i make stuff and so they took everything that was sort of strange and they explained it with narration oh, that's always dumb good. yeah yeah that's narration great. that's good how did chris yeah, feel dumb it down. Was was he, did chris kind of think that you had made a mistake or was he like yeah, he, well he was just trying to get the movie out so he stayed with it and sure. kept them involved in it and stuff but that was the end of my uh you can't, you know, that's the way it goes. You sign a thing that says you sign it there. You work at their pleasure, you know? Right. You oh, can't complain. Wow. I mean, nobody can be surprised. You work for a movie studio. It's not your own house. They didn't come to your house. <laughs> you know, never will. And then there was the whole, the, I, I guess, you know, we should talk, uh, you know, quickly about the, the Pootie Tang debacle. Because, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people that love you, uh, you know, look at that movie as as this you know cult movie. Yeah. And, and I remember when you were going through that, that you had a, a very specific vision for that movie, and it was the first time you had studio backing, and yeah. then you had to go through that process where the the studio you know gutted you, took yep. your power away, Hated and then it, stole yeah. your movie. That's right. It's terrible. And terrible and, and like I just it. remember that there there was this point when you had your first cut. Yeah, and you were ready to go, and they screened it, and and who was the big executive? She was famous that that sat there. Who? Uh, well, Sherry Lansing. Sherry Lansing, was running right. Paramount at the time, and they sat down with that movie that you were ready, that you were done with. Yeah, and you were there, and what happened? Well, I I went out to L.A. for a screening. Really, John Goldwyn was the main guy that we dealt with there. He yeah. was Samuel Goldwyn's grandson. This yeah. guy. So you, of course, attached a great legacy, knowing you, that's sort of like you're part of yeah, the movie history. Yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah. yeah, that was a big deal to me. And yeah. I, I still, to me, it's like... You I remind love... me more of John Milius, actually, <laughs> in, than Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> yeah, probably with, you know... But I, I loved uh, that experience, even in its at worst time. I was very unhappy. It was very stressful. And there were times where I... It's one of those things where your back gets put against the wall, and then they, somebody it feels like somebody's pushing on your chest, but you don't have anywhere to go do you know what i mean yeah things got worse and worse and i started to wonder what my capacity was as a filmmaker as a human being i wasn't sure what my capacity was to take the stress i was taking on so you made this this and cut the fear that i was living right with. but your your vision as, as a filmmaker is is fairly specific and that was a fairly specific yeah, i made that movie exactly the way i wanted right, to it was a, and in cutting it i found out first of all that i had made a flawed movie like it wasn't it wasn't good yeah i didn't make a beautiful movie that paramount destroyed i made a flawed movie that didn't really hang together as a feature i would if i with the wisdom i have now I would have, if I were them, just let leave, let it uh, be released the way I made it. Yeah. And just see what happens. It wasn't a big risk. It was a $3 million movie. Yeah. And Chris Rock was in it. Yeah. It, it made its money back the first weekend. It was fine. Yeah. I would have just let it go because they wasted an enormous amount of money. Recut. They recut for almost a year. And uh, they just poured money into it trying to make it better. And it never was going to be any better. It just got worse. But did you get that feeling during that time? Because I remember the time where there's a story about, uh, you know, about Ken Kesey. And yeah. one flew over the cuckoo's nest, which was a stage play. You know, he he agreed yeah. to letting them make the stage play right. from his book, but he did not sign off on the movie. Right. And there's that story where they 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 figured out a, a legal loophole and they based the movie on the stage play. And an interviewer right. asked Keezy, "Did you go see the movie?" And he said, "Look, if a couple of hell's angels came to your door and knocked on your door and said we're raping your daughter, you want to come out and watch? Yeah, would you go? No, that's very. It's a good way to put it." But I didn't think of that movie as my kid. Also, I signed on to it. Uh, when we first started talking about doing Pootie Tang, they were going to do it with Paramount Classics, which was like a, their little indie yeah. arm. And they were going to make it for $2 million. And I was so excited. And then they said they wanted to make it for three and do it with Paramount proper and give it to John Goldwyn and make it as a real, even though it wasn't a lot of money, as, as a studio movie. And I said I didn't want to do it because I thought that would process would destroy it i didn't think i could work under that yeah not on pootie tang right it's a crazy idea but then the interesting thing about like knowing how to, politics in, in show business work which yeah. i think this was the big lesson for you is that you know they then took the movie and they hired people you knew 
and had worked with on the Chris Rock show, which you also wrote. That's for. right, and also movies uh, on my little short movies. I had a lot of people on it. Rick Shapiro was in Booty yeah. Tang. Well, but I All mean, these just guys in had se- done this goofy but, stuff with right. But in the sense that they were going to take your movie and then rewrite it and recut it. Oh, you mean it. when they? Yes, when they when they went to redo it. Yeah, uh, they uh, they hired Ali Leroy, who was uh, a writer. He was one of my friends one of my right one of the writers i worked with on chris rock yes. now did that destroy relationships for you or at some point did you no, just we're not accept? friends now oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i hated what he did to the movie but you know i don't know he just he had a his job was different than what my job was so right. i look at it very differently now but at the time i was yeah i was pissed off at him so getting back to the job and for hurting, for hurting, hurting the, movie. the movie yeah <laughs> yeah uh he unless he gets fired, they can fire you. But firing a director is difficult and it's messy and nobody likes doing it. So right. they just move shit around. They just move the venue. Yeah, that's it. They just move and don't tell you where they're going. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So I, I eventually found. Uh, I, I called the editor. The new editor was a guy named George Folsey, who was used to run, I think, Universal Pictures. He was a big producer. He made. Um, what was the guy who made uh, Blues Brothers? That director, uh, John Land- Landis. Landis. John Landis and he made movies together, and he edited all of John Landis's movies, including the Blues Brothers and all these great comedies. Right. So uh, he took over the editing, and I called him, and he, I was really angry that he was editing without me. And then at one point he said, "Listen, I, this is the reality. They gave me the movie to edit. Um, what are you gonna, you know? Let me work on it for a couple of weeks with their concerns in mind, and then." Uh, you can come in and we'll talk about um, and you can look at it. But I'm not hurting your movie. Just you know, he was a really great guy. So we did an edit with me and him together. And he was hurting your movie. No, he wasn't. He actually ended up. He was hired to get it away from my vision, but he ended up liking the way I wanted to make the movie. I I converted him, and we did a cut together, which probably got him in some trouble. I I, pre, I like he's a guy I'll never I'll never forget because he did that for me. So why is it so hard to fire a director? Is it just all union it's stuff? Just nobody likes to. You know, a part of it is that these a lot of the executives in Hollywood are just fucking pussies. Yes, they don't want to have the moment. I wouldn't mind if I felt like somebody was fucking up a thing that, I, and I don't believe it, that you shouldn't fire a director. Right. I signed when I made that movie. I signed a reg- regular uh, studio contract that says I serve at their pleasure and they can replace me on a day's notice. I knew that, so I can't say they took my movie away. They hired me to work on a movie that I happen to have written and that I care a lot about. But I got thrown off because I wasn't doing what they wanted. That's the way it works. But well, they didn't have the they didn't have the balls to do it. The one point I went to the they hired another editor and then I they flew me out there first class, put me up in a beautiful hotel, and I went to the edit they and the producer on the movie at the time um, invited me to the editing room to watch the reels. You know, movies are cut up into like right. five reels. So I would watch reel one and then he'd go, "Thanks for coming." And I go, "Well, I have some suggestions." And he go, "No, we can't take your suggestions." This is already in the works. Oh. And I go, well, what do you, when I'm, how, what's my input here? And he says, if you have suggestions, you can email them to me later. And I said, but you already locked the reel. And he goes, yeah. So what's, what will be done with my suggestions? And he said, nothing. He said this to me. And I said, so you're not letting me work on the movie. And he goes, go back to your hotel and email me. Like he just, he, he flew me out there and put me up, um, just to 3,000 miles just to get fucked. And, uh, not be allowed to work on the movie. That's something I won't forget either because that was like a, a like a chess move on his part. Like I couldn't say he didn't invite me. He sure did invite me. Sure. He's got the receipts to prove it. Right, right. I flew him out of your first class. Um he when did he put him up in the best hotel in town and all he did was come to the editing room and cause problems. So I had to I, I had to restrict his access. And that's the story he told people, which is not true. So um, and he basically just said, "Go back. I'm, we're here talking, but go back and email me." Yeah, go. But you know, you're, I'm, you're not. You can't sit in the editing room and make suggestions because we're too late in the process. We're locking the reels now. What does that mean, locking the reels? It means that it's picture locked, which means you can't change any frames. That you've you've started to print the film. So he said, "Go back to your hotel room and write write me emails." And I said, well, it'll be done with him, nothing, because the reels are already locked. It was like, it was just so insulting. And when he did that, I I had the reaction that he programmed, that he expected, which was, I got to get out of this. This is too personally painful. I mean, I had been working on this. I directed this movie. It, it was such a emotional thing for me. It was a year that I'd been working on it. And so he knew that if he did that to me, it wouldn't be an outright firing or grievance that he could right. that could be brought against him. But he knew he would break my spirit, which he did. It, it made me. I sat in the parking lot. I called my wife at the time, 
and I told her the story, and she said, I think it's it's time to let this go. What would have been a strategic, like, as in a ch- say in a chess move, if you weren't as emotionally attached to it, what would have been a way that you look back on it, like, okay, I could have actually done this to counter Well, I that. wouldn't have made the trip out. I wouldn't have made the trip out. I would have said I'm not going out there till I, you know, I want the editing room back here or something. You can't fight those guys. They own the movie. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I did, I, you know, I had a meeting with a, a, re, a big director at the time who t- told me some things that you can do. One thing he said is when they take the movie away from you, it's inevitable. It happens to almost every movie right. that the director loses control during the editing. But the thing you can count on is that the studios don't have any better ideas than you do. Um, and they don't really want to edit. They don't enjoy the work. You know, you, it's your idea. You have the creativity right. and you like it. They don't like it, and they don't know how to do it. So they'll, just to be protective and, uh, you know, territorial, they'll take it away from you. Let them take it. Don't fight it. It's like if a dog is biting you, they tell you don't pull your hand away because you'll actually tear your hand right. on the teeth. What you do is you push your hand further into the dog's mouth. I've never heard that before. Yeah, wow. because then you're not, you're not tug- tugging on the teeth that are in your skin causes tears. Instead of just a puncture, but if you push your hand into the dog's mouth, it'll actually have to open its mouth wider. So you wow. push your hand in, like punching the dog in the face while it's, uh, you know. The ball's uh, on the first guy to discover that. <laughs> <laughs> to have the, to the fucking low heart rate enough to do that. But uh, you have to do that in those moments of stress. You have to go. I'm not going to tug and j- right. jerk back. I'm going to either push in towards the trouble, or I'm going to just keep calm and let it bite me and just and just take it and that's the best way they say we want the film and you go okay here's the reels here's my notes go ahead because what's going to happen is they're going to give it to some young executive for two weeks he's going to do an edit and he's going to get all excited and show it to the exact to the big guys and they're going to go what the fuck do you do this movie's worse now yeah Give it back to the director, and then the, that executive will actually come to you. Please help me, <laughs> please. You know, he he foresaw that, and there was a version of that that happened. They did reshoots on Pootie Tang, and they asked me to direct the reshoots. Oh wow! Because they didn't know another way to go. I had made something that was pretty unique, and nobody knew how to handle it. So is it embarrassing at all? Like, because again, it's, it's comics. We kind of get used to. Like you said you're used to bombing. We get used to. Yeah. But is it embarrassing when like you know the whole cast sees a certain thing? And, mm-hmm. and you're like, you know they've taken it from you. Do you feel like, ugh, like I don't want to face those people? or do you Yeah, feel there's like- a lot of hu- humiliation in it. I mean, when I did Pootie Tang, uh, by the time it was finished, I was disgusted with the whole thing. And I was also a pariah. Like, I was not hireable as a director. It ruined my filmmaking career. A good example of that is, is I haven't been hired as a director since then. Um, I directed one movie that's not a good record. It's better to do, do two. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, the year 2000, I made Pootie Tang. It's 2011. I've never directed again. But what that's how much it hurt me. But at the time, when it was coming out, I remember it was so humiliating. It was so hard. The pressure was so much because something was out there that I didn't like. I got an email on my website back when we had like community boards on our websites. Yeah. And somebody wrote me yeah, and yeah. said, "Do you like? should I go see Pootie Tang? It was coming out in a few days, and I wrote back and I said, I don't know, I haven't seen it. Because in truth, I hadn't right, seen it. Right, right, right. So that was my response, I haven't seen it. Somebody at Paramount who was trolling my website saw this, and they got scared by that, that they had over-breached. They had taken me, taken too much advantage. <laughs> so they got worried, I think, of the DGA, the Director's Guild. So they wrote me and said, please come watch the movie, and they gave me another first-class ticket to come out and gave me a screening room at Paramount to watch the movie. And I flew out there um, and went to a screening room and nobody, like it was weird, nobody was around. It's like they cleared the yeah. streets, the the hallways at Paramount so nobody would have to talk to me. And I sat, because John Goldwyn, who ran Paramount, hated me. He hated the movie. He hated me. He was He was royally angry at the movie. Um, but anyway, so I sat in the theater and I watched it, and it made me sick. I just hated, you just hated what you saw. Hated it, hated what they did with it, and uh, knew it was coming out that day. It was, that was opening day, and um, I remember David Gale, who ran MTV Films. I think he still does. Yeah. They were partly involved. He's the only guy. He in front, like, just walked over and shook my hand and said, "I'm glad to see." You. He was the only guy who pretended to be my friend in the past, who kept pretending to be my friend, or was. I really liked that guy. And he and he gave me. He brought me a review from Elvis Mitchell, who was writing for the New York Times at the time. He, who found one review from him, and he loved the movie. Oh wow! So I got to experience for five minutes 
before I saw the film, before I saw it, the, his review, and I was really happy for five minutes about it. Then I watched it, yeah. and I was like, this is shit. And then all the reviews started coming out. Hateful, hateful, piles and piles of hateful reviews. And then, you know, uh, just Rope, what's his name? E Ebert. Rod uh, yeah, Cisco Ebert, yeah. Roger. Roger Ebert, who I grew up watching on sneak previews on PBS uh, till before it was even a big show. Um, said this movie's not even bad. It's not complete. It's not a movie. Like he didn't even give it the respect to pan it. He said, "I can't review this movie. It's not. It's not a film." And he was right. He actually said something really smart, which was he said, "It looks like people took pieces of a movie someone else made and manufactured this strange product out of it." And that's exactly what they had done. They took my movie that I had made and they put it together. But anyway, so so it was hard to have a movie out that was getting panned with my name on it. I had the option to take my name off of it, but I didn't because I I felt it was my responsibility right. that it was bad. It's part of your job as a director. The point is, I've been the center of attention of negative attention a couple of times. I've I've had my worst nightmare come true, and I survived it. It didn't hurt me as badly as I thought it would, and indeed, there I I gained every time, gained hugely, and I wouldn't trade those bad experiences right. for anything. So what that tells me is, when I start trying something, the bad version of it, I could take it. Like I have no fear because I've my worst fears have been realized, and it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. It, it would be like if you if you started boxing and you're like, I'm afraid to get punched in the face. Anybody is, and your first few times you get punched in the face, you're like, I don't hate this, right? And I'm good at the boxing, and I'm not dead. I'm not dead. I don't hate it, and I'm I'm succeeding sometimes. Why this is what I'm going to do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And you have complete control where you, here. Oh, at FX is totally unbridled control, but it comes with good. I mean, it's it comes with credibility. I, I have also I've had failures, but I've turned shit out. And by the way, the two failures that I've had have both, in my view, been vindicated by people watching. People still watch Lucky Louie, yep. and people still love Pootie Tang. Was trending on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, like right. it was all over the place. Really? Yeah, it never stopped. I mean, every every great. Uh, musician that I've been near has come up to me. Jack uh, uh, White, is that his name? Yeah, yeah. Came up to me and said, Pootie Tang, that's all I do is watch Pootie Tang. Oh, wow. Um, that, so so I, I have credibility. That's, why, that's how I got this thing, is they know they're not going to... And also, failing ain't that bad. That's what I mostly learned. When I did a Pootie Tang was the highest profile project I'd ever done. That was a movie, right? It was yeah. a movie, and it got killed really hard. The critics d destroyed it, uh -huh. and it was humiliating it was the worst and i was told by my agent um i you'll never work in movies like my agents never say bad news my agent no. said i can never get you any more work <laughs> and i was like fuck wow that's tough that's intense so i went on the road doing clubs and after a month of feeling kind of bad about what happened i didn't care anymore um, I guess I could ask you, you're just not afraid of realizing, okay, this was a terrible mistake and it's, it's, I fucked up everything. Yeah, I'm I don't fascinated mind that. I don't mind that. That's because my er the early things I did w went badly. And you're so not afraid of financial training. insecurity or any of that stuff? No, I mean, I did uh, this movie, Pootie Tang. It was the first sort of high, the whole thing I did on my own, you know, and uh, and it was despicably hated. So I know what that feels like. And it was also the, the the studio took it from me. I was a total loss. It was every kind of bad. Mm. And I went through it all. And there was days where I was like, I don't know if I can survive this. Like, this is more than I can take. And then after like, uh, I don't know, two weeks after it was over, um, I was like, I'm fine. And I remember I was in San Francisco uh, mm. doing the punchline just as regular. Uh, the Pootie Tang had come out. I'd spent a, like two years making it, poured my heart into it got taken off it, had it changed into something I hated, had that released, hated by every possible critic. And then, like, I took two weeks to just take time off, and then I went to do the punchline. And I'm on a treadmill at a gym near the punchline, and I feel really good. I feel like, hey, I'm okay. And I there's Entertainment Weekly on the treadmill, and I'm reading it, and it says, Loser of the Week, Louis C.K. <laughs> oh, <geez>. Wow. <laughs> because, you should, you should. because of Pootie Tang. And I just started laughing really hard. I was like, how fucking hilarious is that? And what a great life 
to be reading that I'm the loser of the week. It's just such a fun thing. So much better than any other job. I used to fix cars for a living. I, this is so much more fun than that. Yeah. And then I realized um, I, I can do anything because I did the worst version. So I'm not a, it, being able to do something great. Kind of everyone has some of that in them because a lot of that is luck. But being the really when you really uh, what makes you capable is being able to survive. Right. Something going to shit. Okay, went back to pretty time for one second. Yeah. You, you ever think of uh, doing it the way you wanted it made originally now that you No, I, I don't think it was a good idea for oh, the okay. movie. And also I the cut I had, the my edit of it, like some people have asked me, do you, don't we want to see the we want to see the director's cut? It's worse than what they okay. made. Gotcha. No, it just didn't work. It was a okay. bad movie. Okay. <laughs> it was a bad right. movie. Can't can't escape it. Well, it's There's like some bombing funny, on funny stage. moments in it. It's like bombing on stage where you bomb horribly. You're like, well, it's nothing's gonna hurt that bad. Like, it, no, it, that's, that's why, yeah. the pinnacle of feeling shitty. So that's right. So I've done that. I can do other shit. So I don't know. Being able to go into that kind of realm enables you to do some fucked up things. Really needing something to succeed kind of narrows your right. You know what I mean? I can't do that. It might go badly. Right. Yeah, but. Think about if it doesn't. Of course. How fucking cool that'll be. Something that should have bombed and right. killed. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a nice. Uh, that's rare. That's a nice treat. Yeah. 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 And then I don't know if this was while you were writing for Conan, but Pootie Tang, which I know in a sense was a very frustrating experience, this film that you did in 2001, was that also, though, the thing that put in your mind the importance, which you've carried to this day, of just retaining creative control of things yeah that it's not really worth it if you if you're just trying to say i make movies th that's a horrible way to make a living right. if you if you're not enjoying it um because what it, happened with that like, well i just got pummeled with pootie tang and I, I mean i started by making a very strange little movie that didn't quite work so the i the fault started with me because i didn't i didn't really execute the film very well and then once it was time to try to fix it they don't leave it in the control of the, at the time, 29-year-old, you know, comedy writer, right. a first-time director. They take it away, and then it becomes a, it gets knocked around studio executives and producers and people who, you know, deal with you in a very contemptuous way. I was, I was treated very poorly, but I, I deserved it in a large degree, so that's the way that goes. And there's no other way. That's how movies go. It's a hardball. It's, yeah. it's a tough racket. So if you can't take that, then don't do it. It's the way that goes. And also I learned as I went through the system with Pootie Tang that the people who were putting that kind of pressure on me and the people who were punishing me had worse pressure on them. And they were dealing with even less friendly people <laughs> because there's money on one end and there's art on the other. And the right. closer you get to the money, the harder it gets. And you think the person, you know, when you're a young filmmaker, you're like, this producer's being a dick. But you don't know what that producer deals with. Right. And the person they're dealing with is horrible. Right. So I learned that. I learned to have empathy for my executive partners right. and to learn that they were there to, in the end, they want to make movies too. Everybody that's out here is just trying to make movies. There's a million better ways to make a living than to make entertainment. So everyone you encounter loves doing it on some level. Do you um, think that...